be like we're at a restaurant. Sounds like a plan. Okay. And I'll read your intro here as soon as it says, I tagged you in the post, Natalie. And later on, I'll make sure it's on your page. And if it's not, I'll take care of it and add it there. Thank you. You're a wonderful press agent. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> so Facebook people, welcome today to Comic Spot. And this is where this was created so that this military veteran could vet out veterans of comedy. And today, boy, have you got one here for yourselves. <laughs> Look what you did, Facebook. You have someone here, you have no idea what you're about to get into. We have today over in the other square, Natalie K. Levant. Did I pronounce your last name correctly? Absolutely perfect. Oh, it's so beautiful. It sounds French. We'll have to get into that. I'm going to read her intro that she sent to me word for word. So here oh, we no. go. This will be the best intro I've ever done without messing it up. <laughs> I started doing stand-up almost nine years ago, could not find a place for myself. The beat-up recliner one of my sons and his wife had given me was not an option, nor were needlepoint bingo and babysitting my grandchildren. I failed volunteering at a senior law center, kept telling them to sue their children. Once I held that mic in my hand and heard the sounds of laughter and love, I knew I had come home. I had found my place. I have performed at the New York City Comic Strip, the, 19, the 1776 House, the Grand in Wilmington, the Taj Mahal in AC, and the finest dive bars along the East Coast. I have won several competitions, including Comic Cure, March Madness, and the Northeast Comedy Cabaret. My pal, Dan Mahone Sr., and I produce a monthly comedy show, Now You See Us, at Ray's Happy Birthday Bar, voted one of Philly's best neighborhood bars. I adore that young crowds want to take me home to their mother, grandmother, not so much. Hearing from folks of all ages whisper in my ear, Never stop, especially the ones who say you've given me the courage to take guitar lessons True. and or follow my dream. That's my plan. Channel six has done a feature about me as a well as well as the Inquirer appeared for on Fox, the Q show with Quincy Harris. I was recently interviewed by a journalist with the London Guardian for a feature article. I am part of a documentary recently finished with my New York producer, director in submission to several film and net film festivals and networks. I however reached actually, I however reached actually surpassed one of my main goals in comedy to disgrace my family. And that is who Natalie K. Levant is. Let's welcome her to Comic Spot. Hey, welcome. Thank you. Do we have anybody still watching after that five hour introduction? I thought you were going to condense it or <laughs> anybody still awake? <laughs> Give me the reader's digest version right <laughs> exactly oh my goodness i i thought some of me was going to land on the cutting room floor i've been there many times <laughs> Do thank, what? You. <laughs> thank, thank you. you so much natalie welcome let's talk about you as a little child let's go there what were you like um, well, uh, that's, I haven't been asked that one before. Good. Uh, I was an only child for almost, uh, I guess, for almost 11 years. Then I, um, then I have a sister. Um, I was a very good little girl. I, when I, uh, try to 
think back 150,000 years. I was a very good little girl and um, adored, adored by my parents. Um, to this moment, my daddy is my hero. My daddy, people say, well, uh, unconditional love. I really, uh, he was the CEO of that. Not that I was better than anybody. Uh, I wasn't any, any better than anybody else, but um, whatever I did was okay. It, I, I, can't, I can't give you um, in words the feeling that, like I said, I carry to this moment his sense of humor, his just um, acceptance really of all humanity. And I felt it uh, to this day. Uh, yeah, never can I find the right words, but uh, my, my growing up, my uh, early years, um, they make me happy to think about. Yes. So were you funny as, you know, were you being told you were funny or did you always, were you the class clown? No, How, no, 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 not at all. Um, I don't mean that I, I was serious or, you know, uh, depressing to be around, but no, I, I was not the funny one. Um, I did have one girlfriend, I remember, who was always joking, Barbara. Uh, but no, no, I did always lust for show business. I, I think, I'm, I'm going to tell you, I think, Linda, when I was born, mm -hmm. the doctor spanked me. I swear to God, I thought he was applauding. <laughs> so, there's something in that DNA. Something in that, yeah. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah, I, I know when my when my friends early on were going to, you know, children's theater, Beauty and the Beast, Little Red Riding Hood. I, like I said, my parents were uh, so giving. We weren't wealthy. They, whatever they had, they gave to their children. I was going to see. Carol Channing in Gentlemen Prefer Blondes, you know, that children's theater was not for me. It just something, um, yeah, I was sure I was going to be a Broadway star. So would you say that when you were growing up and you were in your early years that maybe you had an old soul? Because it seems like you were at a young age watching more mature things on Broadway than your peers. Is that correct? I don't know whether that's an old soul. I understand the question. Maybe mm -hmm. it's that um, along with the other gifts that my daddy gave me, he gave me absolutely no sense of reality, what? which is really a gift. Yes, yes. Really? Yeah, I mean, even today. Well, this is not working. All right, just don't worry about it. Go over here or, you know, try this. Uh, just um, my husband, who was very down to earth, very good man, but had a very difficult um, growing up, the antithesis of mine. And he would say to me lovingly, are you ever going to live in the real world? I would say, well, you know, not if I can help it. <laughs> I know what you're talking about when you when you speak of this. I totally get it. I, I kind of thought you would. We have to make um, the reality that isn't working. We have to find a way to make it work. Yes. What's been the biggest thing in your growing up that's helped you along the way in this Michigana business of comedy? Um, well, um, over the, um, after I uh, got married and had children, like I said, I always had this penchant for show business. And, um, 
I didn't do much when I was in high school or college at all, except try to see as much theater. We had a wonderful theater in Pittsburgh that, where I grew up, the Nixon, which was kind of like the Miriam Schubert in Philadelphia. We got a lot of the pre-Broadway uh, shows. But after um, we had four children, someplace along the line, after our youngest, whom we adopted from Korea as an infant, um, I started doing community and dinner theater. Then, um, as you said in my intro, um, I didn't know what to do with myself when my husband passed away. Um, we were so family oriented. I really didn't have girlfriends and I just didn't know what to do with myself. So this is a long answer to your question. One day when I was volunteering um, at Silliwim here uh, in Philadelphia, which is a uh, community resource for HIV folks. And I was sitting with another volunteer and I made him laugh. <laughs> I get it. <laughs> because he said, why don't you try stand up? You asked me about, you know, the biggest, the moment in comedy. Well, this is, he said, why don't you go and see my friend at Taboo, which is a uh, gay club here in uh, Center City. Mm -hmm. He's doing a monthly comedy show this summer or weekly, whatever. Mm -hmm. I, I thought, okay, why not? You know, I, I, I was, not, was not fitting in with all these other ladies, you know, who were talking recipes and all that shit. So <laughs> I went, I went. And I'll tell you, um, when you're embraced by um, the gayborhood, uh, yes. they feel loved. So I guess that would be uh, the most life-changing uh, comedic moment because uh, yes. I didn't know what I was going to say, what I was going to do. Would they like me? You know, what shall I wear? Uh, I didn't know a soul there. I, they embraced me. How and wonderful. I felt it and I still feel it from crowds. It's a, at least I'm trying to remember eight months of isolation, but yeah, it's out there. Yes, yes. So now, since we're talking about your family and your early years, your last name is Levant, Levant, and there is a famous person who I think you're related to that I wanted to know if I could bring that up. You, uh, you're talking about Oscar Levant. Yeah, well, um, all I can tell you is uh, I grew up in Pittsburgh, which is where Oscar was from. And uh, I knew as a very, you know, preteen, I never had a brother. Uh, who was a dentist and another brother, I think, who was a doctor. But um, my husband always said that, and he kind of explained to me, but I don't remember the connection quite. Um, Oscar and my husband's father were like second cousins. That nobody can play the piano. Nobody. Yes. <laughs> I know if we're related and nobody is as witty as he oh. was in the in the field uh, could anyone be more self-deprecating than that man I mean yes his his humor is is just timely I'd like to challenge anyone listening to this video to do an, a service to Natalie by looking up who Oscar Levant is you know, especially if you're a comedian or call yourself one, you know, look into the rich history of people who have gone before us. And Oscar Levant is a legend. So oh, beyond, yes. Beyond. He was the biggest thing I remember growing up. And well, not only was he a brilliant uh, pianist, um, he was very well known for um, playing 
George Gershwin's Rhapsody in Blue so magnificently. And you can still Google, I mean, you can Google that, YouTube, whatever. Um, but his wit, there was a, um, a show 100,000 years ago, Information Please, where they had, yeah, and Oscar Levant, I mean, he was, the things that he, he thought of and were just brilliant. I so, think he was on What's My Line one time. Mm -hmm. And I saw that episode. I should do Ancestry.com. But I, every time I thought, think about doing it, I just think particularly my daddy's side of the family. I know what my ancestry is. Whatever country had the biggest alcoholic rate. <laughs> really? So that's my end. But if anybody wants to find Oscar Levant, please let us know. Also, please, looking at myself, oh my God, someone tell me, I have like a COVID coiffure. <laughs> I don't know what it's hard to do. I really don't. I haven't had my hair cut in like eight, nine months. I, I, you know that that picture that pops up every so often, how are you doing? And this pathetic woman with dark circles and his hair, you know, oh, I'm good. <laughs> They're gonna call me. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd like to know after schooling and did you go on to college or trades or straight to work in the city? What, what was your trajectory after formal schooling in high school? I went to uh, Pennsylvania, what was then called, <clears throat> excuse me, Pennsylvania College for Women. Um, it's now called Chatham. Um, I really, I really wasn't interested. I, <laughs> I learned how, the best thing I learned how to play bridge. <laughs> AKA now blackjack. <laughs> um, I stayed two years and I didn't want to go back. And my daddy who really asked so little of me, wanted me, you know, to have a college education, which of course, I shouldn't say of course, but he did not have, I think he was one of nine children. And I think he went as far as ninth or 10th grade. So I went back for a third year. And then I really didn't like it. Um, I, I liked my friends, but I really I majored in psych. Anyhow, I left after three years and I went to work in a medical office uh, in Pittsburgh. Uh, and I loved that. And I met my husband when two of my girlfriends and I went, we actually flew from Pittsburgh to Atlantic City. Found my husband on the beach. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I had the three years uh, was fun, but college wa wasn't for me. And I didn't go away to school, which I kind of would have liked to do, but I never did. Yes. Well, I'd like to know about the very first time you said, you know what? I'm going to throw away everything that's makes sense and I'm going to try comedy. What, what was it like the first time you went up on stage? Um, I, I don't know that um, I could really feel what I was feeling. Um, I went to this, as I said, this club taboo, and I had performed in shows, and I had actually even done a one woman show wow. uh, a number of years before, coulda, woulda, shoulda, which was uh, my um, unrequited love affair with Broadway. So uh, I don't, I don't think that I was. Um, uh, nervous about being on stage, um, I think that my feelings were, um, I wanted to make them laugh. 
And am I, you know, is this funny? Does anybody care what I'm saying? Because one thing I always have felt about a performer, I have to believe you. If you're going to bullshit me, even if it's funny, I, I just am not going to really laugh. I, I need to believe you. I guess that's one of the reasons why uh, the comics that I most uh, revere always gave you so much of themselves. Sometimes, you know, a lot of comedy comes from pain. Yes. And um, so I think it was just, you know, what if nobody laughs? What if, you know, what if I get up there and they're very, you know, um, polite, but uh, what if no one laughs? Well, I guess we'll find out. Yes. But and, thing that, and how did it go? It, they, they, well, clearly um, they gave me some kind of a, a sense that, oh my God, you know, they're laughing. Maybe I can, you know, this feels so much different and so much better than any of the things that I've, you know, been uh, on, on my quest to find who I am uh, and stay out of that fucking recliner. This is absolutely, you know, a feeling I have never had before. Yes, yes. So what have you learned in comedy that you did not expect to learn? Um, I think I've learned one of the things that I've learned. Mm -hmm. You really, you really dig deep, baby. <laughs> one of the things I've learned um, is that after you come out on, after you pick up that mic, mm -hmm. you, you and uh, the crowd, um, join, hopefully, uh, join uh, hands, um, make a connection. Yes. Um, there's almost nothing that you can do up there with that mic that is not going to be accepted once they accept you. Um, it's that uh, unconditional. I mean, it's not always, you know, doesn't always come up roses. Sometimes you really have to work, you lose them. Uh, you have to kind of learn how to get them back. But the nights that when you um, just stop and take a, a sip of water and they think it's hysterical, I've learned that, you know, that you sometimes can make a connection where, um, the crowd gives you un that unconditional love. Yes, yes. And we, you know, we get, go out there and, you know, we don't know what's going to happen, but when it happens, it's, uh, you know, it's a rush. Yes, it is. You can almost feel the air lifting you up. I'm like sorry. You can almost feel like you're floating on a cloud. Uh-huh. Uh -huh, and, and it stays with you. You go home, you get home. Oh, the last thing you want to do is go to sleep. Right? Uh, that's don't right. Know. So oh you my know. gosh. It's so wonderful when it goes, when those nights when you can't do anything wrong and the silliest things you do even get laughs. Yes. Or, because, you know, you've already, you know, it's kind of like a love affair. And, um, you know, you have bumps in the road, but you never stop loving. Yes. And kind of, you know, uh, the same thing. It's okay. Don't worry about it. We love you. Tell me something that a fan said to you, someone that was watching you maybe for the first time, who would, but something that you've never forgotten that someone has told you when you got done. Um, well, as you said in my introduction, uh, people have uh, come up to me 
uh, I, I always had the what turned out to be misconception that older folks would relate to me right away because you know we're contemporaries. Well, not really. Nobody's as old as I am, but you know, generally contemporaries. But I have to work harder for them um, sometimes because um, I, I'm breaking the mold. I'm not aging gracefully by their standards. So um, I, I, I know that's in the room sometimes, but when an older person has come up after a show uh, and it has happened a number of times, I'm very blessed and said, uh, you're an inspiration, please never stop. That, you know, that along with the folks who have said to me, you, you've given me balls. Wow. On a, whatever your dream is. I'm, I'm, I'm going to uh, uh, bungee jump. Uh, I'm going to wear uh, that strapless gown that's been hanging in the closet for 40 years, you know, and, you know, that's, yeah, that, when I started, you know, doing the stand-up, did not expect that, that, that kind of heavy stuff. Yes. What is something that you have not yet accomplished in comedy that you have to accomplish before, before it's too late? Um, having either um, Jeff Ross or Ricky Gervais open for me. <laughs> I told you I don't live in the real world. And I mean, if, if <coughs> excuse me, if absolutely necessary, I'll open for them. <laughs> We're sort of pressed for time here. <laughs> do you have aspirations to do comedy in any particular venue? You mean besides Madison Square Garden? Yes, that's the one I want to do. <laughs> well, you can open for me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'll do it in a bathroom. I don't care. <laughs> uh, okay, if they have two stalls, me too. <laughs> Hashtag me too. <laughs> like I said, who needs the real world? Yes, shoot for the stars. Always, always. always. What was that Casey Kasem used to say? Well, you know, one of the things also that um, if you've been blessed to have some really um, off the wall or um, memorable moments in your life, uh, bring them out when you need them and remind yourself um, that they're out there and, you know, try when this shit is over to make some more of those because you need those memories when the shit hits the fan. Yes. And uh, that's uh, particularly, I think, <clears throat> true now, even yes. if are locked in like today having this interview with you this yes. is a thing this is well, a thing and um thank you yes thank you and just whatever it is you know i'm not telling you to you know walk outside and down the street naked <laughs> you know just do something that you can look back on and make you smile yes yes I'd like to give you the next, up to the next five minutes to say anything you want to people listening that I didn't, if, I, if there's something I didn't drag out of you that you want to make sure people know, like where you want people to follow you or where you want support or where you want them to come to shows when the world opens up. You mentioned you have a weekly show. 
Uh, yeah, my my um, good friend, Dan Mahan, uh, who is not only a good friend, but um, uh, I don't know how I ever thought that I was going to have any kind of a career in comedy because I can't fucking see to drive at night. <laughs> Enters Dan Mahan. So not only is he um, my partner uh, in, in crime at Ray's Happy Birthday Bar, where we do our monthly show, but um, uh, talking about making memories, uh, Dan, you know, I, I've been asked to do a show in Bumblefuck. Uh, I'll take you. I'll take you. So... Um, where are we? You, you asked, well, me anything, asked, anything you want to say. Yes, uh, talking to Linda and like a whole lifetime of stuff you brought up. That's great. Um, <laughs> we do a monthly show. Um, I do have a website, um, tastelessdiva.com, where you can um, look at the merchandise. Um, not really uh, the best person to toot my own horn. I'm on Fuckbook um, and I'm there for the public. I call it Fuckbook because it fucks with your head. Why do you care if somebody doesn't like you? Uh, they're not your friends. They're your imaginary friends. So <laughs> enjoy. Um, I guess I could add that um, <laughs> when I close my show every uh, every time uh, I'm um, finishing up my set uh, wherever um, even if it's a quote unquote clean show <laughs> they have like 30 seconds of material to do and have to, have to pad that but <laughs> Close my show. I always tell the folks I've been on this planet years, the combined ages of everybody in this room. And I've only learned two things. That's all, just two things to share with you good, good people. Um, the first is never know your place. Wow. Wherever you are, loveys wherever you are it's yours wow it, it belongs to you wow and the other thing i tell them is if anybody tells you to act your age tell them to go fuck themselves <laughs> so that that about sums it up that's beautiful Boy, you have really good timing. I was listening to the pacing that you did deliver that. Well, wow. make it interesting. You have very probing interviewing skills, my dear, as well as being a very funny lady. Thank you so much, Natalie. My mother, uh, the only thing I want to say about myself is that my mother used to tell me, Jesus Christ, you ask more goddamn questions than three wise men can answer. <laughs> you well, certainly, little did she know that would be one of your callings. Little <laughs> did she know. Yes, well, like I said, um, you certainly shook up the cells <laughs> in a good way, in a uh, good way. And I have the feeling um, that um, we might just be in those ladies' room stalls at Madison Square Garden. <laughs> Let's do it. I've got a portable microphone. I'll bring it. Never give up on your dream. <laughs> That's one of my dreams, I'll tell you. Well, you've been a delight to come on the show, and I just adore you. I have adored you from a distance for over three years, and now I feel like I have a connection with you. Well, I, I, I have um, felt the same way um, because, as I had said earlier, 
uh, I'm, I'm a sucker for honesty. And um, you certainly project that. Thank and you so much. Not really real. Well, you do a hell of a job projecting it. <laughs> it's hard to fake that. I can Broad fake it some. <laughs> Thank you, Thank so you much. Linda. Thank Have you a so much. Stay safe. I love you. I love you. Be well. You too. Bye. Bye bye. Bye.